Father, thank you. Thank you for kindness towards us. Thank you for a love we've never known before. Thank you for your presence here with us. We turn our hearts to you. We recognize your presence here. And I just ask that you would, by your Holy Spirit, unveil Jesus for all to see <laughs> in, in worship, in adore, as he in fact is in your holy name. Amen. 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 So I want to start with how you ended the book here, Gentle and Lowly, outstanding. You say here, go to him. All that means is open yourself up to him. Yeah. Let him love you. The Christian life boils down to two steps. Go to Jesus. And step two is see number one. Right. <laughs> I love that. Talk, talk to me a little bit about this, this simplicity that you have found in Christ. Oh, man. I, I rolled out of bed this morning, brother, not believing that. I mean, at reflex level. You know, I, if you ask me the, the question theologically, I'll give you the truthful biblical answer. But I wake up every day and down at, at instinct level, I am thinking, okay, what are the hoops I need to jump through to get God's smile biggest? over me? Uh, what are the things I need to do? What's the ladder I need to climb? What are, how long do I need to pray? And actually, <laughs> that's turning Christ not just a few degrees off, that's flipping him into the opposite. That's the photo negative of what he is way down at deep in his deepest heart. What he wants from me every morning is to fall into his arms. It actually, it feels scandalous. It feels too, too easy. Wait a minute, just let him love you. But we all deeply resist it. We are fleeing, letting him love us. So my job every day, I, and I'm not saying there's not sweat spiritually to our lives. There's effort and labor for sure. But my job fundamentally every day, I believe, is to collapse into the arms of Jesus Christ and let him embrace me and sort of uh, let me get melted afresh into becoming a believer all over again <laughs> and start my day that way. Praise God. I think you even write in the book here, we don't climb into God. We collapse right. into him. Right. There's another section that's right in a line with what you're saying right now. You say, this is so incredible. I read this to a group the other day and I, could, I just started crying. <laughs> so hopefully I can keep it together. But you say here, there is an entire psychological substructure that due to the fall is a near constant manufacturing of relational leveraging, fear stuffing, nervousness, scorekeeping, neurotic controlling, anxiety festering silliness. That is not something we say or even think so much as something we exhale. You can smell it on people. People, though some are, of us are good at hiding it. And if you trace this fountain of scurrying haste in all of its various manifestations down to its root, you don't find childhood difficulties or Myers-Briggs diagnosis or Freudian impulses. You find gospel deficit. Good Lord. You find lack of felt awareness of Christ's heart. All the worry and dysfunction and resentment are the natural fruit of living in a mental universe of law. The right. felt love of Christ really is what brings rest, wholeness, flourishing, shalom, that existential calm, that for brief gospel sane moment settles over you and lets you step in out of the storms of of workness. You see for a moment that Christ, that in Christ you are truly invincible. The verdict really is in nothing can touch you. He has made you his own and he will never cast you out. Goodness gracious. A greater paragraph I cannot find. Praise Talk God. Through. That That's, I mean, uh, that, I, and I need that brother. I need that today as much as ever to, to be aware that th this weird anxiety that I am a factory of all the time, which is informing, snapping at my kids or being short with my wife or being impatient with a colleague Actually, <laughs> it's that that is connected to my getting traction with the gospel, the good news. Um, uh, there's a, a place there in Galatians 3 where the, the text says, for all who rely on works of the law, ESV translates, literally what it says is all who are of works of law. 
we are, as fallen people, we're, we don't know how not to operate in a universe of law, of um, do, of perform, of get it right. It's how the world functions. <laughs> and, um, and so when we get, and I can, I latch onto this for maybe 10 or 15 seconds at a time, <laughs> and then I'm back into law. But when we can get some traction with, wow, even though I am a total train wreck in so many ways in my life around me and way down deep, people don't even see what a mess I am. Nevertheless, the banner over my life is guilt-free, righteous, innocent, adopted, reconciled, purchased, forgiven. <laughs> and we could keep going with what the New Testament gives us. And that is objectively true, not mostly, and I at the last 10%, but 100%. And actually, uh, Eric, the logic of the New Testament is, if I've been united to Christ, then in order for me to lose that banner over, over me, in order for that to get um, go up in flames, Jesus Christ himself would have to get pulled down out of heaven and put back in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. That's not going to happen. I'm united to a resurrected Christ. Wow. Therefore, the verdict that he won and that he enjoys I, I have it as much as he does, <laughs> as, as safe as he is, I am. So every day, my job and your job, I believe fundamentally as believers is to re-believe that mm. every day and then walk in light of it. And that's what, where the fruit of the spirit is going to flow out of as we're enjoying that. Wow. Wow. I, I think it's Galatians 3.18 that says, by faith, we receive the spirit. Hmm. So it's that act, that faith that actually grants the spirit. You say also something very similar to this right here. You say, uh, you say the spirit makes the heart of Christ real to us. Not, not just heard, but seen and not just seen, but felt not just felt, but enjoyed yeah. the spirit takes what we read in the Bible and believe on paper about Jesus's heart and moves it from theory to reality, from doctrine to experience. You, you find the spirit is doing this constantly through the gospel? Oh, that's what the spirit does. I mean, there, we don't want to be reductionistic and say, be one dimensional. The spirit has a multifaceted ministry in our lives. Okay, that's true. Um, here's what I would want to say, brother. The, the Holy... Actually, I don't enjoy salvation. I don't experience salvation if there's no Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. If it's only Father and Son, the Father ordained salvation, the Son accomplished salvation, but it stays outside of me unless the Holy Spirit connects me to it. So the Holy Spirit plugs me into Jesus Christ. And then here's what he does. Here, Take a verse like 1 Corinthians 2.12. <laughs> uh, now we have received not the Spirit of the world. Oh, really? What kind of Spirit have we received? But the Spirit who is from God, comma. Now here's the key phrase the end of 1 Corinthians 2.12, in order that we who are in Christ, we might understand the things freely given us by God. Charizomai, freely given. It's, it's the verb form of the noun for grace. In order that we might understand it, it doesn't mean merely cerebrally, cognitively, like two plus two equals four, I now understand. No, what it means is the biblical way of knowing, which is whole person, holistic. We know with our heart, our mind, our will, everything. We know what we might understand the things we've been graced with. <laughs> so I get the, why do I have the Holy Spirit? Among other reasons. So that I get to not just know the recipe of the gospel, but stick the pie in my mouth of the gospel and enjoy it and experience it. So the spirit gets it out of the book and into your life. Bingo. What you're saying. So you say here, we are drawn to God by the beautiful heart of Jesus, which you are showing mm -hmm. the spirit reveals to us. Right. Talk to me a little bit about this journey that you went on seeing the tender and gentle heart of Jesus and how it changed you. Oh, well, <laughs> I, I'll try to squish this into a couple of minutes to just to honor our time, but it's a long journey, but in a couple of minutes, brother, um, thank you for that question. And it's such a joy talking with you, Eric. Um, I, through my late teens, 20 seminary grad school into my early thirties, I was getting my doctrine right. And that matters. Um, but right doctrine is not alluring. It's important. 
but crossing your T's and dotting your I's theologically, vital as that is, is not actually a matter so much of, of beauty. What I need, well, I, I want right doctrine so that I can clearly see, like focal lenses on a camera, clearly see who Christ is. But it's not the doctrine itself that draws us in. It's through the doctrine so that my lenses are clear. I can see Jesus in all his beauty. And I don't know about you. I wonder if we have actually neglected the category of beauty, the aesthetic, in how we talk about God today. 300 years ago, Jonathan Edwards was talking about it. There are Catholic theologians who have talked about the beauty of God and others down through church history. Um, and maybe maybe beauty feels too mushy or too effeminate or something for men like us. And I know men and women are listening to you, uh, to you and me. But I, I want to recapture hmm. beauty as a category for how we think about God and Christ and the gospel and the Christian life. Because when I stand at the brink of the Grand Canyon, I'm not, I'm not satisfied unless I can say to someone else, look at that and yeah. have our mouths agape together. That actually consummates the joy. C.S. Lewis talks about this in his reflections on the Psalms book. In or, uh, um, to look at beauty and enjoy it is good. But what really consummates the joy is looking at beauty and expressing our how beautiful it is and enjoying it with someone else. So that's that's one way to understand what the Christian life is. <laughs> it's amazing. I think it was C.S. Lewis who said that praise is the commencement of enjoyment. Yes. Yes. Yeah. As you've yes. tasted, you say, oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Uh, right. John, John Piper wrote, "If our to the degree our praise is without feeling, we diminish the thing that we praise. Wow. <laughs> so. There's here uh, a, a section here that you start talking about the yoke of the Lord. You say here that the, his yoke is a non-yoke. I love this. And his burden is a non-burden. What helium does to a balloon, Jesus' yoke does to his followers. We are buoyed along in life by his endless gentleness and supremely accessible lowliness. He doesn't simply meet us at our place of need. He lives in our place of need. Talk to me a little bit about this. Praise talk. God. It's not a concession for Jesus to love us at our worst. That's what we, that's what we believe in the church. We think he's, he's, uh, his smile is really big when we're doing great and obeying him. And then he still loves us, but he's, you know, uh, come on, he's, he's holding us at arm's length. He's holding his nose over us when we are not doing great. Um, but look at what that text says there in Matthew, his yoke. We're not talking about egg yolks. That's Y-O-L-K, his Y-O-K-E. The thing you put on oxen for two oxen to plow a field, that yoke. We are all walking around with yokes on us. We might not uh, talk about it or think about it or be aware of it, but we have a yoke of of how we think our parents are disappointed in us or a yoke of not having the GPA in school we wish we did or you know whatever. Um, and Jesus says, I would like to exchange yokes with you. <laughs> if you simply have the humility to receive it, which many don't, if you will simply open yourself up to it, I'll make a trade with you. <laughs> I'll swap with you and I'll take your heavy burdening yoke <laughs> and I will give you my yoke, which actually is filled with helium and it will as you just read there, buoy you along in life, because actually what his yoke is, is, is the Lord Jesus Christ himself coming along and putting his arm around us yeah. and saying, I'm going to walk you through this barren wilderness of a world, this hell of a world. I'm going to walk you through. And as you're getting shelled with all the shrapnel of the craziness of the world, I'll let it sink into my flesh, not yours. Mm. And I will walk you into heaven. Uh, that, that the, because my, because my heart is, gentle and lowly. And um, I, that, that's who I am. He's saying, I want, if you will receive it, if you're too proud and you want to do it yourself, th so be it. This is for, this is for those of us who know we are destitute. Um, uh, this is where his heart is, is powerfully drawn. And so it's deeply consoling. Mm, it's like, by virtue of the fact that he is savior, our weaknesses attract him to us. Huh? Yeah, I believe that. Yep. <laughs> so I feel like when you start talking about how he is in his heart, mm -hmm. this is what causes us to fall in love with him. 
Yeah. He's just, he's so beautiful in his character and glory and nature yes. that to see him rightly is to be swept up as, as St. Augustine said, he stole my heart and ran away to heaven with it. I so love it. Do you find that as you've experienced his heart more and more, it just causes you to fall more and more in love with him as, as the days go on? Uh, yes. And I would love to sit here and say, I've got it figured out now, but I'm a total mess. So I'm still, I, I'm a toddler in this. Like I'm toddling along and off and falling down like a two-year-old, um, but I'm learning it. The scripture and the Puritans are helping me to learn it. Mm -hmm. uh, my own screw screwiness is forcing me to learn it. But here's what I would say, Eric. Um, yeah, I would say this very respectfully to anyone listening in. I say this to my own people here at the church. I'm sitting in Naperville Presbyterian Church. I say this to my people regularly. Uh, the Jesus you're bored with is not the real Jesus. Mm. Um, and then, I, I, again, I want to tread very cautiously here, but I would say in truthful love, if you're bored with Jesus, the problem is you, not him. Yes. And I'm not trying to put anyone down. I'm trying to lift Jesus up right. because the, the real Christ, when you see him for who he is, oh, my goodness. he is irresistible. If you see him truly, if you're bored with him, you don't, that's a decaffeinated Christ. If you see him for who he really is, <laughs> a heart, a heart that's open, that's alive, that's willing, that, that's searching, that the Holy Spirit is helping, uh, you cannot but go to him because he's that beautiful. So, um, so that's what I would say, brother. Ah, oh, that's so amazing. There's a section here that you said something that I feel is so, I don't know, neglected, mm. but you said this, listen, listen, this, this blows my mind. So you said the fall also entrenched in our minds, dark thoughts of God mm. thoughts, that are only dug out over multiple exposures to the gospel over many years. Right. So you're right. finding that you're shedding bad thoughts of God the more you meditate upon the simplicity of Christ in the gospel? Oh, heck yeah, don't you? It was John Owen, the old Puritan, the English pastor 400 years ago, who, who spoke of dark thoughts of God. Oh, it's like the parable, I think, in Luke's gospel, where he says uh, the, the parable and the the, the five talents, the two talents, the one talent, the five and the two invest it. The one talent guy buries it in the ground. And when the master comes back and rebukes the one talent guy, the, the, the servant says, I knew you were a severe man. I knew you were a hard man. And actually, one of the things Jesus is saying in that parable is that's how we all naturally and reflexively <laughs> think about God. We think of him as miserly. We think of him as loving us. But mm, just, you know, it, it, with, with restraint. And, um, and actually, that's not who God is at all. The whole creation of the world, the reason this world exists is it is the overflow of the intra-Trinitarian love, Father, Son, and Spirit, loving one another. Uh, did God create us because he needed us? No, he created us because his love was too great to be contained. It had to spill out like you hold a glass under the water faucet and it fills up, but then the water's got to go somewhere. If you leave that faucet on and you leave the glass under, it's got to spill out. That's the love of God creating this world. So what does a Christian life look like? Among other valid things and perspectives, the Christian life is 10,000 10, experiences of becoming a Christian again by coming back to the good news of the finished work of Christ on my behalf. That does not need a little bit of help from me, but no, help. I, I lose it if I try to help. It. Wow. I enjoy it when I don't help it. I receive it. And, um, and then uh, 30 minutes later, I, I have forgotten it and I go back to it again. And this is actually how depth with communion with God is fostered wow. by 10,000 and a million um, fresh reacquaintances <laughs> with the goodness and the glory of the good news throughout our lives. This is amazing. I can hear while I'm talking to you, the chuckle of the gospel <laughs> in your heart. Uh, I remember Martin Luther talked about how uh, the gospel is the announcement of Goliath's head being removed. Oh, I love that. <laughs> I haven't caused, heard that. <laughs> uh, it causes a shout amongst the people. <laughs> he's dead. He's, he's gone. So this, this is where we'll end up here. This is, portion of your book. It's page 99. If guys that are watching, get this book. It will 
it will literally be like healing balm to your heart. You write here, allow yourself to be allured. Why not build into your life unhurried quiet where among other disciplines, you consider the radiance of who he actually is and what animates him, what his deepest delight is. Why not give your soul room to be enchanted with Christ time and time again? When you look at the glorious older saints in your church, how do you think they got there? Sound doctrine? Yes. Resolute obedience? Without a doubt. Suffering without becoming cynical? For sure. But maybe another reason, maybe the deepest reason, is that they have over time been won over in their deepest affections to a gentle savior. Perhaps they have simply tasted over many years the surprise of a Christ for whom their very sins draw him in rather than push him away. Maybe they have not only known that Jesus loved them, but felt it. (laughs) Praise Mm. God. Will you just end with talking a little bit about this Christ and then maybe praying for the people? Oh, you bet, brother. Yeah. Um, Being a Christian disciple is not only stockpiling theological data. Uh, It's not less than that. We want to grow in that way. But it is is being ever more deeply afresh and again (laughs) re-enchanted. And I get that from C.S. Lewis in an article he wrote called Talking About Bicycles. He had the worst titles for his essays, but it's a glorious little essay, Talking About Bicycles. Re-enchanted, um, uh, as opposed to going cynical and cold. Re-enchanted. Um, and uh, uh, here's, here's what I would want to say in closing to our brothers and sisters who have joined us. Um, that place in your life where you feel most defeated stuck the the place in your life where you feel like i i i i I can commune with god in all these other regions of my life but this place this is where he will not go because i am just so uh ashamed and regretful that place in your life where you feel deepest shame regret remorse i am such a moron kind of feeling that not elsewhere that is where Christ loves you the most. That's where he loves you strongest. That's what I believe is indubitable from the Old Testament God and the New Testament Christ. And uh, that's actually, Eric, that's, that's a kind of Christian life that we can enjoy living. Like, that's doable. That's sustainable <laughs> because it's a win-win. And so I, I rejoice that he is that kind of savior. And with you, I want to spend my life sharing that with all my fellow unbelieving friends and believing friends, all of whom, like me, naturally defy that. Let me close in prayer. Father in heaven, we want to ask you to help us according to scripture. See who the real Christ is. Yes, with our minds and intellects, and also even more deeply with what Ephesians calls the eyes of our heart so that we would be um, drawn to your Son by the Holy Spirit and actually walk around this miserable world aglow (laughs) because of who you are as your own luminous resplendence is shining off of and through us until the day we die. In Jesus' name, amen.